All right, if everybody take a seat. I'd like, uh, before we start our last panel, actually we have a, uh, one more special thing to do, and I'd like to introduce Jim Green for that. Okay. Great, thank you very much, Bill. Well, you know, it's um, my really great pleasure uh, to present our last Planetary Science Division Award. And this is a, an incredibly important individual in the history of planetary science. Uh, from 1971 uh, to 1978, he basically had my position. And I have to tell you, his career is really enviable. I know what he went through. He's written a fabulous book, which is back on the display. Uh, please leave through that. In fact, when I, um, six years ago, took, had the opportunity to be the uh, Planetary Science Division Director, um, I found out about the book and I read it thoroughly. And in fact, uh, what's really great about that is um, uh, how the rivalries between the scientists, how he's worked uh, with the projects, uh, with the federal budgets, how he helped reshape the missions, and how he met the challenging priorities and schedules and vehicle configurations. And I know what that's all about. And a number of people in the audience do too. But let me tell you his record. 1971, Mariner 9 was launched. 1972, Pioneer 10 was launched. 1973, Mariner 10 was launched. 1975, Viking 1 and 2. 1976, Helios 2 was launched. 1977, Voyager 1 and 2. 1978, Pioneer Venus 1 and 2. Now, if that's not a golden age of planetary science, I don't know what is. And so it's my very great pleasure to give a Planetary Science Appreciation Award uh, to Robert S. Kramer. <laughs> well, come on up here. Well, let me come down. And now on to our last panel. Andy? Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, and let me, uh, I know this is not uh, near the, the end yet. We will be there. Uh, but I want to say before uh, I forget to, to thank Bill and Roger and everybody who put this conference together. It's been terrific. I just want to say, <laughs> glad you did it. Um, we're going to do things a little differently on this panel than we've done uh, up to now, partly to keep you guys awake, um, partly to keep us awake. Uh, but what we'd like to do is we're going to have presentations that will be a little briefer. Uh, each panelist is going to talk for 10 minutes or so. And then we're going to sit down and, and uh, have a, a little bit of a roundtable discussion. And I think we had a really nice uh, transition to this uh, in the questions that, that followed the previous panel where people were asking about, uh, you know, what have we learned <laughs> from uh, all that we've been through and, and how can we use it to improve our chances of succeeding now and in the future. Um, so we're going to be looking back, but we're also going to be looking ahead. And um, before we get into the, um, the uh, discussions, or the, the presentations, I just want to um, mention something that uh, David Grinspoon alerted me to uh, several months ago when we were talking about this upcoming anniversary. You know, December uh, marks the 50th anniversary of the very first planetary encounter by Mariner 2. And on December 14th, 
Mariner 2 flew past Venus at a distance of about 20-something thousand miles. And, um, you know, there had been a lot of speculation about what Venus might be like. Of course, it was hidden and is hidden by uh, dense, opaque clouds, and so nobody really knew. We had clues to what Venus was like. There were, uh, for example, uh, very strong microwave radiation that had been detected from Earth-based observations. And people speculated that maybe this was due to the fact that Venus was uh, surrounded by a very warm and wet atmosphere. In fact, I remember uh, when I was five, six years old, right at the time of Mariner 2, in my uh, astronomy picture books, there were uh, some paintings that artists had done that showed Venus as a kind of a Jurassic swamp um, with uh, Venusian dinosaurs. And uh, that looked pretty cool to me. Um, but Mariner 2 made one observation, and it's so elegant. It really is a beautiful um, example of, of what can be done with a very little amount of data. Um, it scanned across the disk of Venus with a microwave radiometer. And it looked at how that intensity of microwave emission varied across the disk of the planet. And if the, they knew that if there, if there was an increase in the, in the intensity towards the, the center of the, of the disk, then the heat was coming from the surface. Whereas if the emission was most intense at the edges, where you're looking through the most atmosphere, then that would point to a very hot atmosphere. Well, guess what? The intensity was greatest in the middle, and that's how we got our first awareness that Venus is, in fact, a hellishly hot surface uh, underneath uh, an atmosphere that's much less hot. Um, and that simple measurement um, began the, the age of, of in-situ planetary exploration. Well, our first uh, speaker is going to uh, talk a little bit about um, the precursor missions that um, were so prominent in the early history of the space program. Glenn Bugos is a uh, historian at the NASA Ames Research Center. And in fact, he's written a history of the center called Atmosphere Freedom, which has come out in two editions. Um, and he's written many articles on uh, various topics in, to do with the history of Ames. He also has an interest in business history and has been a corporate history consultant. So Glenn, have at it, but 10 minutes. Thanks, so I am a historian, and uh, one issue that confronted me uh, when I joined NASA about a decade ago was how to make sense of LADI. LADI started as a robotic precursor, first as a lander for an environmental survey network, then one quick uh, spacecraft to baseline lofted dust before the rush of expected human exploration uh, on the moon. Now LADI is seen primarily as a science mission, gathering data about the lunar exosphere, while the modular bus is a key part of a private effort to build a lunar network. None of this yet has launched. The technology has changed modestly. How it's been viewed over time has changed dramatically. That's why I first started to look uh, at what it means to be a precursor, and my research is focused largely on the robotic precursors to Apollo. Now, I think it's great that so many of the people at this conference come from uh, JPL. I think if the papers reflected the totality of our agency's solar system exploration, there might be a little bit less about high-resolution photographs and more about data archives less about rocks and more about atmospheres, less about geomorphology and more about astrobiology and astrochemistry, less about flagships and more about instruments, less about planetary science and more about precursors. Precursors, it's such a hopeful word when applied to a, science mis to, to a space mission. It suggests that any mission is a forerunner of a logical course of missions to come. Finding logic anywhere makes us hopeful. Today, the word precursor most often means robotic missions to pave the way for human travel by reducing uncertainty. To talk of precursors is to talk, hopefully, of planetary exploration as if space settlement was to come. Precursors can help here, hopefully, at this conference, where historians and science and engineers are coming together to find some common dialogue. I find even that when talking to people in the uh, hallways here, uh, that even how to frame the issue of science and human exploration together uh, we all have dramatically different expectations of how to do that. The word precursor illuminates contest, conceptual contest, between robotic and human exploration, 
between practices of manufacturing certainty, between ways of viewing historical progress by looking back to the past, as historians do, or by looking forward to the future, as space architects do, between science and technology, perhaps depending on how NASA proceeds these next few years, between public and private. My point is, I hope we all use this term with a little bit more sophistication. Today, any PowerPoint of space architecture starts with the precursor, small, cheap robotic spacecraft, usually in the lower left-hand corner, stepping stones or checkboxes to the ultimate destination in the upper right. If all interested parties can agree that a precursor addresses a specific knowledge gap in spacecraft technology or in what we will find at our destination, then we all agree that we can use it to declare success or failure well enough to move forward with a larger, more expensive program. That's one way that the word precursor invites contest in the negotiation over what data manufactures certainty. Another way the term precursor invites contest is in whether it is best used by historians or by planners. The hubris of calling anything a precursor ahead of time implies that you can anticipate in the nearest future what missions will actually fly. It is easier to define a mission as a precursor historically, retroactively, once we know how the future unfolds, than it is to define one prescriptively as part of a plan. Yet just because historians can't apply the word precursor with more satisfaction doesn't mean the planners can't use it for their own means. The word precursor ha uh, has recently undergone rapid change. With the power of Google Books and the NASA STI database, in the decade of the 1960s, I saw only one use of the word precursor applied to space with the Apollo missions. Notably, it was by a chemist and a discipline where the word has an established meaning as an ingredient that undergoes chemical reaction or metabolic pathway to become a more definitive or stable compound. In the 1970s and 1980s, a precursor uh, was used in a dozen, then a hundred um, more different contexts in situations like Pioneers 10 and 11 being precursors to the more complex Voyager missions. Then in the 1990s, the term exploded into its common meaning. In 1989, notably on the 20th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing, the first Bush administration announced the Space Exploration Initiative, building out station, a permanent presence on the moon as a precursor to humans on Mars, all preceded by robotic missions. This is when what we came to know as the precursors to Apollo um, were the robotic uh, precursors, the Ranger impactors, the lunar orbiters, and the surveyor landers. The history of the early lunar robots is often misinterpreted because of the sheer mass of Apollo in the historiography of, our, of uh, the exploration of the moon. In the first years of the space race before Apollo was announced in 1961, these spacecraft were designed for lunar science and their experiment packages designed to help planetary scientists understand the geology of the moon. There were 13 successful American encounters with the moon prior to the Apollo landing, the first of which happened less than five years before. Quickly and efficiently, these robotic missions laid an experimental foundation for the discipline of lunar science. On the eve of Apollo 11, it was clear which questions remained that the sample return could possibly answer. So these were science missions, but they did, in fact, serve as precursors. With the start of work on the Apollo lander, the robots re were repurposed to collect data useful to Apollo engineers. The changes to the robots were generally slight. Uh, removing the cameras on the rangers was the biggest. The other would be an equatorial focus uh, with the maps and the strain gauge um, added to the landing pads. Before these robots launched, Apollo designers had declared a nominal definition of the surface of the moon, the bearing strength of the regolith, the protrusion of the boulders. This definition was little revised with the data that the robots returned. Still, the robots validated that NASA could get to the moon, orbit it, and land on it. At the time, in the 1960s, what was seen as the real precursors, though not uh, by that term, were the human missions, Gemini and the early Apollo flights. Those missions uh, didn't get the attention just because of the astronauts. They were validating the technology that was really on the critical path to Apollo. Two-week trips, EVAs, docking, lunar rendezvous. Looking in forward in time from the 1960s, those manned missions were the ones that manufactured certainty about Apollo. Looking backwards from the early 1990s, the robots bear the weight of Apollo history and are now usually cast as precursors. Still, some precursors actually follow a recognizable trajectory that makes sensible narrative of space exploration, whether you look backwards or forwards. Probes into lunatary atmospheres, for example, were imagined in the 1960s as ways of learning about the structure of all the many atmospheres in our solar system. The probes had scientific goals since atmospheres teach us much about the evolution of planets. 
They also had engineering goals in that we can design better heat shields and forecast weather at landing sites. There have been a dozen uh, probes since the first probe, the PAET, into the atmosphere of Earth in 1971, up through the Huygens and the Medley Suite and the heat shield of MSL. And the progression of ever more sophisticated probes returning ever better data is what those in 1971 might expect to see in 2012. Let's jump forward to the most recent era of precursors and a final way in which the word precursor evokes contest between, between science and technology, between knowing and doing. The 2005 Exploration Systems Architecture Study, predicated on a big launcher, a constellation was what Harry Lambright yesterday delightfully called precursy. Constellation evoked a reconstruction, both historical and in some ways technological, of Apollo and of old paths not taken after the Apollo missions. But really, it was fueled by two more recent precursors, Clementine and Lunar Prospector, that showed the moon to be wet. NASA's Constellation Office built a robust robotic precursor program with a dozen prospective missions poised to fill knowledge gaps about the moon. This precursor program took flight uh, much later with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and LCROSS. NASA's Lunar Precursor Program, as I understand it, is now largely in hiatus, or at least construed as science. Since 2010, NASA has embarked on a flexible path and will decide where astronauts will go once a launch vehicle is firmly in hand. It could be the moon, Mars, a moon of Mars, or a near-Earth object. With no destination, there is no immediate need for robots to pave a safe way for astronauts. Still, our knowledge of the planets keeps growing. Over the past decade, there have been 10 expeditions to the moon, orbiters and rovers on Mars, and data useful to the taxonomy of NEOs. There's much to make sense of. Historians have spilt much ink over the interplay between science and technology. Those of us in NASA, rather than directly address that interplay, we use a proxy. If something is funded by the space mission director, sorry, something is funded by the science mission directorate, then it is science. If it is funded by the human exploration mission directorate, then technology. The NASA Lunar Science Institute right now is funded by both. Let me conclude with that. NLSI is a virtual institute founded in 2008. Its goal is to reinvigorate a discipline of planetary science started, as we have heard yesterday, about 1962. As NASA's institute, NLSI uh, teams crunch new planetary data to make it useful to those in NASA planning missions, robotic or crude. The NASA Astrobiology Institute served much the same role in the 1990s when Dan Golden kept alive a Mars program with vague precursor ambitions. The NAI teams helped then operationalize the mantra of how exactly to follow the water. The Lunar Science Institute is now being reconceived as a NASA Institute of Science and Exploration. Its purview broadened to the moons of Mars and asteroids. Someday national policy or private investment may again shift so that we can talk of precursors. We will again use the word hopefully, anticipating a future history in space. As historians and scientists, we may use the uh, word precursor to bring focus to the contest about how this future will unfold. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Um, our next speaker is Amy Page Kaminsky, and she is a senior policy advisor to the chief scientist at NASA headquarters and is a PhD candidate in science and technology studies at Virginia Tech. Now, here's an interesting biographical note. She has previously served as a NASA program examiner at the Office of Management and Budget. And I think we're going to be maybe revisiting that part of her career for <laughs> her perspectives on what's going on right now. Uh, she's also been an analyst in the, the Federal Aviation Administration's Office of the Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation and Policy and Outreach Administrator at the National Space Society, former editor of the American Astronomical Society's Space Times Magazine, uh, winner of the 2012 Sacknoff Prize for Space History. She has a Master's in Science, Technology, and Public Policy from GWU and a Bachelor's from Cornell in Earth and Planetary Science, Sciences. And she is going to talk about the Faster, Better, Cheaper program at NASA. This the remote I use? Yes. Okay. Great. All right, we'll see if I still have anything left to talk about now. 
Okay, well, a role of the historian or sociologist of science and technology is to make sense of why and how throughout time certain paths in technical fields like solar system exploration are pursued by organizations, nations, and societies uh, while others are not. Most such so social scientists will say the resulting choices can't be seen as based solely on rational decision making, uh, the state of science and technology, or the idea that these enterprises proceed along a linear path of progress. Rather, they will say, decisions in science and technology, and what's perceived as a success or a failure, also have social and political determinants. And we've already heard a lot about that um, in this conference. As I see it, determining how and why solar system exploration programs embrace particular forms, scales, and destinations requires accounting for both the technical and the social. Uh, and, uh, and conceiving of uh, solar system exploration uh, as a socio-technical system or network comprised of many interacting actors. As applied to solar system exploration uh, activities performed by NASA, these actors include NASA leadership, planetary scientists and would-be mission developers in NASA, JPL, industry, and other institutions, U.S. political leadership, the mass media, and sometimes others, all of whom have goals, values, and priorities of their own, as well as particular interests in and definitions of success and failure for space and solar system exploration. It also encompasses, and I want to stress, um, it encompasses non-human elements, uh, particularly spacecraft, as the technological centerpieces of solar system exploration. Conditions such as the state of the economy, scientific knowledge, other NASA programs, national policies, international space programs, as well as cultural prefer preferences, uh, can serve as influences on, if not uh, arguably part of, the elements of the network. NASA's approach to robotic solar system exploration can thus be seen as the product of how the agency attempts to integrate, resolve differences, and harmonize this network of disparate actors and elements. Conversely, we can think of um, it being the conflict, the cohesion, and the feedback among these elements that shape solar system exploration. And by viewing solar system exploration in this way, and by seeing strategies in the making, so to speak, we can account more broadly for their emergence and in turn see the social preferences, expectations of success, and value propositions that have existed for NASA and its missions. This idea that solar system exploration strategies are the product of a continuous struggle to stabilize a network of elements is quite evident in, as just one example, NASA's move to and then away from the faster, better, cheaper approach to solar system exploration within several years' time. Beginning in the 1990s, the science, engineering, and management strategy entailed the pursuit of low-cost missions. Uh, up to a couple hundred million dollars with limited scientific objectives and that could be flown frequently and visit a variety of destinations as part of a broad portfolio of solar system investigations such that a single lost mission would not sign signal disaster for the entire program. As espoused by then NASA Administrator Golden, these missions um, uh, were encouraged to take certain risks, uh, embracing new technologies and new management techniques to reduce the costs and advance solar, solar system exploration in the long run. So how did the faster, better, cheaper idea come about when it did? Um, Dan Golden is often seen as the catalyst for uh, this initiative. But in short, I would say um, that the incompatibility of various actors' interests with the mission strategy of the previous decade uh, prompted them to uh, adopt a discourse, if you will, that smaller, lower-cost lower missions were possible and necessary for the vitality of robotic solar system exploration. <laughs> Planetary scientists had discussed the idea of solar system, or sorry, small missions in the past, um, but these hadn't materialized as mission opportunities were budget constrained. As we've heard in the late 1970s and the 1980s, planetary scientists tried to maximize scientific objectives on what few missions they should, could secure. Um, and uh, this and the mission's dependence on the shuttle led to very costly missions and only two being launched in the 1980s. This experience made the community reflect more carefully on the value of small missions. 
Meanwhile, staff in the George H.W. Bush White House's National Space Council were frustrated with NASA's penchant for expensive space systems. Uh, they had seen the Strategic Defense Initiative uh, Organization, for example, deploy a space-based uh, ballistic missile system for relatively um, inexpensive cost and, and uh, short schedule, and thought that NASA would need to act similarly uh, to and commit to lower cost systems to afford the Bush Space Exploration Initiative. To shore up NASA program costs agency-wide, they brought in the new NASA Administrator, Dan Golden, um, who was an advocate of, of mitigating cost growth uh, by shrinking the sizes of missions. Also in the early 1990s, multiple Congresses and the Clinton administration committed to reining in federal discretionary spending, including at NASA. Uh, where the agency was concerned, the Clinton administration, who retained Golden as administrator, prioritized securing funding for the International Space Station. Um, but along with Golden and then um, head of space science, Wes Huntress, wanted to see a vibrant program for space science. Finally, of course, we've heard already uh, much about this, but the 1993 failure of the billion dollar uh, Mars Observer and the ensuing media criticism only affirmed for NASA, the science community, and political leadership the prudence of a program of small missions that distributed benefits and risks. So in short, no single mission or no single element promoted the move to fa faster, better, cheaper. It was a convergence of these conditions that spawned NASA not to pursue more flagship missions, nor to eliminate robotic solar system exploration as the Reagan administration had contemplated, but to focus on small missions as a solution that would satisfy these, uh, set the, these disparate actors. NASA's earliest experiences with its two low-cost mission programs, Discovery and, and Mars Surveyor, suggested that perhaps the agency had found, a, found in Faster, Better, Cheaper a strategy to synchronize and stabilize the solar system exploration network. Under the new regime, 13 new mission starts were obtained uh, to a diverse range of solar system targets. Some of these missions achieved low cost using off-the-shelf hardware, but many did so using new technologies and management techniques as Golden had advocated. Um, planetary scientists enjoyed newfound creative license and autonomy under the approach. For example, with the Discovery mission, um, being able to uh, propose and manage entire missions as principal investigators. And mission performance led to a steady stream of science data and results that were published in major scientific journals. The arrival of Mars Pathfinder thrilled the media and political leadership and captured the public imagination as uh, the first successful uh, spacecraft on Mars launched in nearly 20 years. Then in 1999, several faster, better, cheaper missions failed. Uh, one, an astrophysics mission wire in March. Then in um, September, the Mars Climate Observer, fall, uh, Mars Climate Orbiter, thank you, thank you acronyms. And, <laughs> and then in December, the Mars Polar Lander um, with the two Deep Space Two technology probes it carried. Uh, independent reviews following the Mars failures found that NASA had cut mission costs too much, trying to achieve the two missions for the price of one, and as a result, making mistakes that the agency might well have caught with more reviews and tests. But still, the reviewers thought that with adjustments, NASA could and should continue to use faster, better, cheaper as a guiding program management technique. But NASA and Dan Golden backed away from faster, better, cheaper in favor of what I would call a cost-conscious conservatism. Mission, si mission costs and sizes did not return to their, the levels of the 1980s, but NASA began to put more money into each mission. And with each mission costing more, reliability became paramount, and every mission became strategic in value. Failure was no longer an option, and NASA became quite conservative about how it designed and managed missions. I think it's easy to say that NASA abandoned faster, better, cheaper because reliable, building reliable low-cost spacecraft proved too difficult. But this would simply be a technical explanation and not a socio-technical one. NASA might have continued only with small solar system missions with modifications as the independent reviewers had suggested, or invested in a few flagships, or perhaps invested heavily in technologies for long-run advancement or perhaps put the extra funds into other programs in NASA altogether. 
But instead, NASA went in the direction it did because of how the spacecraft fa failures perturbed the network as it, uh, of actors as it threatened the goals and expectations of them. The planetary community, um, as, as far back as 1994 had, uh, and prior to that I would say, but during the era of faster, better, cheaper, had opined that a mix of mission sizes was optimal to serve science. Um, and in 2000, they released a report through the National Research Council um, stating that the faster, better, cheaper's approach stand um, on risk and its restrictions on larger missions had compromised scientific objectives and outcomes. The news media, meanwhile, published stories suggesting NASA had acted incompetently, if not with negligence, on the two Mars missions. In hearings, members of Congress blasted NASA for the failures, calling them national embarrassments, uh, and saying that U.S. taxpayers expected and deserved better. Although each uh, of these sets of actors had disparate interests in spacecraft, seeing them respectively as necessities for their profession and their livelihood and the pursuit of scientific knowledge, uh, as symbols of technological achievement and national pride, and as major taxpayer investments necessitating public accountability, the 1999 mission failures were anathema to them all. Success in solar system exploration for all of these actors meant the delivery of near-term results by individual missions, not the promise or prospect of advancements in solar system exploration over the long term by learning from failure as Golden had envisioned. Discourse about failure thus came to prevail over talk about the need for cost-cutting among the, the network actors, NASA stakeholders. And this criticism, along with criticism during the time about um, space shuttle security, sorry, safety issues um, by NASA's advisory committees, the media, and the Congress, provided the impetus for Golden and Na NASA via Golden to back away from faster, better, cheaper. With federal budgets just having moved into an era of surpluses, the White House, not wanting the solar system program to fail, worked with NASA to increase space science budgets, fund the discovery missions at higher levels, introduce the new Frontiers line of moderate missions, and redesign the agency's Mars strategy. Uh, this, <coughs> so in conclusion, in conclusion, um, this socio-technical analysis of faster, better, cheaper, and examining history in the making more generally, tells us about the complexity and contingency that governs decisions in solar system exploration. It provides an explanatory context for the forms, goals, and destinations of the solar system exploration program, showing just how instrumental each element of the network is or can be in sculpting the programs that materialize at any given time. It also illustrates the challenges of trying to predict and control the solar system exploration enterprise's future. But even as it shows the difficulty of, of predicting precisely what will work or be in the future, this analytical approach provides insights into social expectations, preferences, and interests shaping solar system exploration, NASA, and the US space program. The socio-technical examination of faster, better, cheaper's emergence and decline in particular shows that we have become quite a demanding bunch, collectively speaking, and the quest for perfection and high expectations held for NASA and spacecraft success means the agency's reputation constantly hangs in the balance. Think of what this cartoon would have looked like if curiosity hadn't survived the seven minutes of terror. Perhaps NASA's attempts to communicate ahead of time just how difficult the feat was would have staved off critical news stories and congressional hearings, but maybe not. As long as our standards remain high while the technical challenges and cost of spaceflight remain formidable, debates and policy shifts will almost certainly continue concerning how best to explore the solar system. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Amy. Uh, next, we have Scott Hubbard, professor in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at Stanford, and the director of the Stanford Center of Excellence for Commercial Space Transportation. He is the former director of NASA Ames, and uh, he's written a book called Exploring Mars, Chronicles from a Decade of Discovery, uh, which tells in longer form the story that he's about to tell about reinventing the Mars program in the wake of 
the failures that Amy just talked about. Scott. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, let me just start off by saying this is a truly excellent conference. I'd like to thank Bill Berry, uh, our sponsor here, Jim Green, and everyone. Uh, when you have an interdisciplinary gathering that brings together such disparate knowledge as historians, sociologists, scientists, engineers, recovering executives, uh, you have a whole a new way of, of looking at things. And so I'm just delighted to, uh, to be here. Um, I modified the title just a little bit, um, Exploring Mars Following the Water, a talk I've given many times, but I've added in the next decade. Um, sitting next to my longtime friend and colleague, Wes Huntress, I've discovered that we've become part of history, which I... <laughs> uh, uh, but I'm not a historian. Yes, yes, living history, living history. Uh, but I'm not a historian, and so I'm going to give a little bit of a look ahead as well of where I think that Mars exploration in particular really ought to be headed. Um, as uh, Andy said, uh, much of what I'm going to talk about is drawn from particularly Chapter 12 of uh, the book that uh, I just published. Uh, I have been complimented several times during this conference uh, for being the first Mars czar and uh, putting the program uh, back on track after the, the twin failures in 1999. Uh, but, of course, it wasn't just me. The a large cast of players, including Dan Golden and Steve Isakowitz at OMB, uh, Ed Weiler, Farouz Naderi, Jim Garvin, and a, and a cast of many, many others. What we had the extraordinary opportunity to do was to take nearly a clean sheet of paper and completely restructure a decade of missions. Um, and we started off with the science requirements, what we were trying to do there, uh, and understanding Mars as a system, not a single measurement that hoped to find life, but rather understand the past and present climate, understand the water cycles on Mars, and particularly its biological potential. So uh, among all the questions that we asked, the first among equals was, is life there in the past could it even be there today? Uh, the conditions of habitability of Mars were paramount in our thinking. And we adopted this phrase to explain what we were doing, not only to our colleagues, but particularly to the taxpayers and their representatives. And I found many, many times in that uh, trip between the first floor uh, and the third floor or fifth floor of NASA headquarters having somebody step in who is a staffer and say, so, so what is this Mars thing? And you'd say, well, it's about follow the water and it's understanding the past, present life on Mars. You say, oh, that sort of sounds pretty good. So these kinds of things, although they're sometimes derided as sound bites, give you a way of communication to people who are not insiders that tell them succinctly what you're all about. And I, I think there's value, great value in that. Now, um, I have added with emphasis at the bottom that this decade of Mars missions was not only intended, and in fact I think has, uh, given us an understanding of Mars as a system, it also was fully intended to prepare for the next decade of sample return. And I'm going to just give you, in the interest of time, only one example and that is the improvement in landing accuracy. You see up here uh, what we were capable of with Viking, Pathfinder, and then when we got into the current decade, uh, Spirit and Opportunity, we've gone from Viking 174 miles by 62 miles as the footprint, the error ellipse that you had to deal with, down in the case of Spirit and Opportunity, to uh, better than half that, 93 miles by 12 miles, Phoenix, 62 by 12, Curiosity down to 12 miles by 4 miles. And we would not have even been able to consider at all going to the foot of Mount Sharp and Gale Crater had this deliberate improvement of landing accuracy, the deliberate increase in rover capability been built into the program. And that was not only to be able to sample the diversity of Mars, but to prepare for the next decade of Mars sample return. 
So where are we today with respect to Mars? This, I think, is uh, essentially the consensus of groups like the Mars uh, Analysis Program Group, MEPAG. Uh, we have lots of evidence of ancient liquid water, surface and ground, past geological environments that have preserved this knowledge, uh, understanding much greater detail, variations in habitability, and so in summary, I think we now have the means to prioritize the sites to go and get samples and bring them back. Modern life? Don't know. We're waiting on the uh, methane results uh, with bated breath, which I think will be coming shortly. So, the next decade is shifting from follow the water, which has been extraordinarily successful, to looking, I would argue, for the fingerprints of life. And the way to do that, as recommended by the National Academy of Sciences and the Decadal Survey that we have uh, talked about many times, is with a Mars sample return. A campaign of three missions to land, get the samples, launch those samples to orbit, return them to Earth. And now, why is this the next logical step? Because looking across the full range of things you might do at Mars, and this has been recently re-endorsed by Orlando Figueroa's Mars Program Planning Group, it gives the greatest increase in knowledge that we can have. It is not only an incremental increase, it is rather a giant step function in knowledge because samples can now be analyzed by not just a few investigators, but hundreds of investigators, not only by one mobile laboratory, but dozens of laboratories, and using equipment that could not possibly be shrunk in any current environment to the size of a shoebox to put on board uh, a rover uh, on Mars. You can follow the pathways of discovery with samples here on Earth, something that in situ is very difficult to do. So I'll make one reference to the Mars Program Planning Group, the, uh, the kind of study that was just concluded, and they addressed the question of, as was called for in the decadal survey, can you descope significantly the Mars rover that was supposed to cost two and a half billion dollars and begin this process of caching samples? Can you descope that and still recover the fundamental science? Their answer, as independently validated, was definitely yes. A bottom line here of about half of what the proposed amount was for the uh, decadal survey. It does this by reusing material from the Mars Science Laboratory and other details here that I won't go into in the interest of time. So where are we then on the challenges for Mars sample return? The reason I canceled the Mars sample return that was on the books in the year 2000 because we didn't know where to go that made it worth that large expenditure of time and effort. Today, after this deliberate decade of understanding, we are very well prepared to pick the site to get those high value samples. We have the capabilities to drive to them, to land accurately, the orbital Rendezvous and docking has been largely demonstrated by Orbital Express. Planetary protection and the safing of these samples has been studied. The sample return vehicle, the one uh, that we would bring back these samples to Earth with, was demonstrated through Stardust and Genesis. The main remaining technological challenge is with the so-called Mars Ascent Vehicle. That needs some development, but it's basically a sounding rocket, only it has to land on Mars and sit there for a year and then work with 2.9's reliability. But I think it can be done. So the study by Orlando Figueroa demonstrates that a caching rover to begin the sample return campaign can be developed for far less than the cost of a flagship in 2015 dollars, perhaps one half of that. And I think that given the appropriate technology and instrument development, that a credible Mars sample return mission can now be planned. Thank you. It was great, Scott, and you also came in under time, which is amazing. Um, 
finally, uh, Chaz. Chaz Beichman is the executive director of NASA's Exoplanet Science Institute at JPL and Caltech. Starting in the mid-90s, he helped to develop NASA's Exoplanet program, including ambitious missions like the Terrestrial Planet Finder. His research includes the study of debris disks around nearby stars, uh, which are possible remnants of the planetary formation process, and the identification of free-floating a uh, few Jupiter mass brown dwarfs using the Wise Spitzer and Keck telescopes. As a member of the NIRCAM instrument team of JWST, he is planning imaging and spectroscopic observations of nearby exoplanets. Chad? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it's really an honor to be here at the 50th anniversary of the exploration of our own solar system. And I'm going to speak today briefly from the perspective of a historian, which I am not, of the 50th anniversary of the exploration of exoplanets. And the date on my chart is October 26, 2045. So everything I'm going to say now is my version of history as seen from uh, the 50th anniversary of the discovery of the first exoplanet. So in the 1940s through the 1980s, really, we had the first glimmers of exoplanets that kept coming and going. Astrometry um, was finding in the 40s, 10 Jupiter-mass planets orbiting nearby stars, Barnard star and other ones. They kept coming and going. Eventually, they just went. Um, in 1952, in the year of my birth, Otto Struve, an astronomer, laid out the idea that uh, one of the most burning questions in astronomy was the frequency of planet-like bodies in the galaxy which belong to stars other than our sun, and how shall we proceed to find them? And he laid out the techniques that we're using to this day. Imaging, he regarded as quite limited in scope, given the very uh, great contrast ratio between a planet and its nearby star. Uh, radio velocities, he said, that it's not unreasonable that a planet might exist at a distance of a 50th of an AU, causing a radial velocity variation of a fraction of a kilometer per second, could be just detectable. Um, transits, he said, would be uh, quite observable, about uh, two hundredths of a magnitude, and this should be ascertained by modern photoelectric techniques. He basically laid out the entire program that would come to pass some 50 years later. Bruce Campbell and Gordon Walker at the Canada-France-Hawaii Telescope pioneered the radial velocity technique, claiming to have found seven stars that show small but statistically significant long-term trends. Companions of one to nine Jupiter masses are inferred. None of those actually survived uh, contact with reality. But they invented the technique that is being used today. Dave Latham and company actually found what we now would regard as the first planet. It was actually, they called it at that point very modestly, a probable uh, brown dwarf. So that was the 40s into the 80s. Um, by 1995, the floods gates began to open. And so I mark as 1995, really the beginning of exoplanet research, which we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of here today, or at least for the duration of my talk. So I call that the Annus Mirabilis, the half-Jupiter mass companion to a uh, um, nearby star, 51 Peg. That led to the beginning of the Origins program that uh, Wes and others helped to bring to pass. And it led to the first call by a president of the United States for an advanced telescope. Um, the first call for a, tel a telescope by a president since John Adams called for the founding of the U.S. Naval Observatory. So he called for a telescope to look for Earth-like planets and habitable environments around other stars. Um, that led to, over the many um, years after that, the radio velocity teams of Marcy and Butler, Mayor and K. Lowe's found more than 500 radial velocity planets, a lot of them using the NASA Keck telescopes. And we went from the few planets in our solar system with periods shown there from a few days up to uh, 30 years to what we have now is a huge plethora of planets. These are just the radial velocity systems in terms of their period and orbital eccentricity, a remarkable diversity of systems that just becomes more remarkable with every 
passing day. And this the hot breaking news, of course, in the last week is that we have a hot Earth orbiting the nearby star Alpha Centauri B. Many more to come, I'm sure. So 2005 to 2015 is the, um, the decade, really, of transits. The first ground-based transits were found in 2004. And then the discovery program discussed here earlier um, led to the selection of uh, Bill Baruchy's long ridiculed and now, of course, widely acclaimed Kepler program, which has found more than 2,000 planetary uh, candidates shown here is just one version of those represented in the, uh, in the image. We have now the plot that uh, Torrance alluded to, where you have a mass of the planet, horizontal axis, its radius, and you see Uranus and Neptune up in the upper right, sort of ice giants, all the systems here in Kepler-11, six systems orbiting inside the uh, orbit of Mercury with a range of masses and densities, are they Earth-like, water planets, um, gaseous systems with some fraction of rock and uh, hydrogen and helium, all the way down to Earth-like systems, Kuro 7b, Kepler 10b. We're really starting to discover and do exoplanet physics and planetology with these systems. And of course, we were able to discover Tatooine, shown here, where we actually now have planets orbiting binary stars. And uh, the progress just continues. I'll show here a quote that uh, proves once again you should never say that science can never do anything. Back in 1835, Auguste Comte, a French scientist, said on the subject of stars, we shall never be able by any means to study their chemical composition. Well, a hundred and some years later, um, we are actually using the Spitzer, Hubble, and ground-based telescopes to probe the atmospheric composition and vertical structure and weather patterns on planets, not just stars. We're finding th evidence for water, methane, CO2, and this is just one of the, uh, the uh, spectra of one of the uh, bright transiting systems. So this is really a remarkable step forward. We're actually really doing planetary composition. We're looking at weather patterns on the planets themselves. And I was pleased that in the um, choice between the two explorers now under consideration, that in fact history tells us that the planetary and astrophysics divisions jointly sat together and chose both TESS and FINESS instead of having to choose between them. And so we were able to make a, uh, find a mission that did thousands of planetary uh, transiting systems discover those, as well as making an atlas of hundreds of ice and gas giant spectra. So I hope that uh, you know, has indeed come to pass. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? The other thing that's been happening, that happened in the 25-2015 arena, was imaging of planets. Young Jupiter's still contracting and giving off energy from their gravitational, slow gravitational collapse. We've been finding planets using extreme adaptive optics on large ground-based telescopes, presently 5 to 10 meters, eventually 30-meter telescopes. Also from space, we have Fomalhaut, we have HR8799, and then we have Beta Pic, which sure first shows up on one side of the star, disappears for a couple of years, and then comes up around the other side of the star a couple of years later. Um, so 33 years ago, from our perspective now in 2045, we have uh, 798 planets, around 630 systems, and on top of that another 2,300 Kepler candidates. And this just shows the discovery year and the different techniques that were being used, radio velocities, transits, microlensing, imaging, pulsar timing, and the, we had zero planets before about 1989 and Dave Latham's uh, first discovery going back to 2000 BC when people first started speculating that there might be other planets out there. Um, after 2015 to 2025, we have more census taking. We have images and transits from space. The Europeans are very active in this field. The Gaia mission will go up and find probably some 2,000 um, Jupiters orbiting stars within about 200 parsecs. The new ESA small mission their version of small, faster, better, cheaper, called CHEOPS, just selected a few uh, weeks ago. Um, 
a, the ultimate and Dan Golden faster, better, cheaper mission called the James Webb Space <laughs> Telescope. Uh, went up and found water on super Earth with spectroscopy. Also was able to image young Saturn. Um, planets such as those that were shown here planted into an image of uh, HR 8799 simulated with JWST. Um, so that was a very active period. Um, beyond that, 2025 to 2035, we completed the understanding of planetary system architectures and imaged the first nearby Earths. We used uh, the WFIRST mission and microlensing to probe out beyond the snow line. ESA's PLATO mission found hundreds of Earths for which we also were able to use astro seismology to get accurate stellar ages. Um, NASA then selected a modest size one and a half meter coronagraphic telescope and was able to image Alpha Cen B planets C, D, and E, which turned out to exist, including an Earth in the habitable zone, and uh, obtained spectra of dozens of other gas giant planets, and an ESA Chinese mission did the astrometry goals originally set out for the SIM mission and identified 10 habitable zone Earths among the nearby stars. Finally, in 2040, the Life Finder mission was actually launched. It was a human robotic tended facility at L2, enabled giant telescopes to be built, there's visible coronagraph, an external occulter, a Darwin class infrared interferometer, and announcing today at this meeting, breaking news, three of the 10 habitable planets found by the uh, ESA Chinese astro astrometric mission proved to have signs of photosynthetic life. And now I want to enter into a little bit of speculation with my last slide. <laughs> um, so just announcing here that complementary searches of, on our own solar system and towards other systems were able to find life in our own and other solar systems. So the Mars colonists were able to find non-DNA life by drilling deeply down into a deep aquifer on Mars. And then finally, Jill Tarter's granddaughter received the first SETI signal from one of the LifeFinder target stars. Thank you.